one. All right. So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the January 30th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County in accordance with the board policy 830 8311, the chair of the committee at their discretion and after consultation with the staff liaison may convene an in-person committee meeting. Otherwise, all committee meetings will be held electronically. Today's meeting is being held virtually and broadcast through Microsoft Teams. To conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Da, 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 da. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Regino if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Regino, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Certainly. Ms. Dominowski? Yes, here. Mr. McMillian? Okay, Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Kuhn? Okay. okay. Mr. Gino, please call the roll of staff members participating in today's meeting. Mr. Hartlove? Here. Mr. Tantliff? Present. And if there are additional staff participating that were not mentioned, please state your name. Dr. Mary McComas, Chief Academic Officer, present. Uh, and if I'll hand it off to uh, my team, Dr. Holmes, if you'll go next. Dr. Jeffrey Holmes, Senior Executive Director, Curriculum and Instruction. Okay. Ms. Shea. Good afternoon, Megan Shea, Executive Director, of Teaching and Learning. Present. <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Melissa Wisted from Academic Services. Okay. Kim? Dr. Ferguson will be joining us momentarily. Uh, Dr. Elmendorf? Hi, Doug Elmendorf, Executive Director of Academic Programs and Options. Good evening. And we have Ms. Myers. Good evening, Allison Myers, Executive Director, Special Education. Other members of um, CNI, if I could have Mr. Billingsley. Good afternoon or good evening. John Billingsley, uh, Director of Social Studies K through 12. Uh, Ms. Kraft. Jennifer Kraft, Director of English Language Arts Pre-K to 12. Ms. Fisher. Good evening, Sherry Fisher, Director of Career and Technical Education and Fine Arts. Ms. Frock. Good evening, Denise Frock, Fiscal Officer for Curriculum and Instruction. Um, let me see who else. Uh, Ms. Lanza. Amanda Lanza, Coordinator of Library Media Programs and Educational Technology. Ms. Hernandez. Good evening, Jennifer Hernandez, Director of World Languages and ESOL. Ms. Mashinda. Good evening, Kasele Mshinda, Director of Mathematics, Pre-K-12. Ms. Schumacher. Christine Schumacher, Director of Science, Health and PE. Good evening. I do know we also have some members from other departments. Ms. Piper. Good evening, Debbie Piper, Coordinator of Teacher Development, Department of Organizational Development and Leadership. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, Mr. Stovenauer. Uh, good evening, David Stovenauer, Director of Technology Solutions Support in the Division of IT. Thank you. I think that concludes all the uh, supplemental staff for this evening's discussion. Thank you. I'm sorry. Good evening, uh, Carla Simons. Uh, oh, sorry, Carla. <laughs> sorry, Doctor. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, is there any other additional staff that has not been called? No, um, Miss uh, Dr. Ferguson, can Ferguson text me? She said her mic is not working, but she is trying to get that technical piece fixed. So thank okay. you. Okay. 
And is, I think, Mr. McMillian, are you present? Okay. All right, I believe that's it. Mr. Kuhn just said he's here too. Okay. Okay. Over to you, Ms. Demonowski. Okay. Mr. Harlow, please review the curriculum contracts. Uh, sure, and Ms. Dominowski, I knew there was a, a request about the um, the updated uh, operating budget information. I didn't know if you wanted to where you wanted to start. If you wanted to go there first, um, or, or it's your call. Your call, whatever you want to do. Since we have all the curriculum people here, let's do the curriculum first. Uh, I appreciate that's a I, that's a good thought, and I, that's a good place to start. Um, is um, is with thanking all the staff who um, who who uh, uh, showed up. I know I wasn't able to give you uh, a tremendous amount of notice, but I really appreciate it. And I um, I would say to the board members that you know there these folks really care about what they do because they're here and they want to you know they want to get you the answers to your questions. So um, it's really great showing of our of our staff tonight. Um, so this was uh, the, the report that was requested, the data that we were able to uh, uh, provide. This is this information has been loaded out onto uh, board docs. There was a replacement. Uh, there was an additional field that was requested, so that field was added. So anybody from the public who pulled the report earlier, um, the report was updated. Same information, just the additional field of uh, board appro approval date was added. Other than that, the information is exactly um, the same. So I thought uh, what I'll do, uh, Ms. Dominowski, is I'll step through the report uh, to understand it, and then um, um, then we can talk about um, the uses of the report and uh, open it up to your questions. So start with just a, a description of the report. Um, the report is a list of uh, contracts. It has the contract number, a, uh, the contract name, the organization that, uh, that is associated with the contract. And what I would say with these, these the organizations, you'll see different names. For instance, on this first uh, page, you see academic services and academics. Um, it depending, it was kind of when, when uh, uh, contracts were put into place. We had different organization structures at different times, so there's a possible that we have kind of some different names for, for similar departments. Um, but we pulled everything that we thought was curriculum and instruction uh, related. Actually, we found out that we pulled some things that really weren't necessarily uh, uh, directly related. So there's some additional data in here that's maybe a little bit over and above uh, what you, you what you had requested. but. Um, um, so the next field is the one that I spoke about earlier, the uh, board approval date, and this is the board meeting that uh, where the this this particular contract, for instance, the first contract on the list, JNI seven seven zero one six, was brought to the March. I'm sorry, the April. Um, um, no, the yes, the April nineteenth, twenty sixteen, uh, board meeting. That's where it was approved. Uh, the next field is the contract expiration. That's up to that's is the the most up to date uh, date that we have that would include any um, extensions, um, the term of the or, uh, original contract, and then if there's an extension. Um, then getting into the data that the 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 financial data that that you're that you uh, are interested in, um, the first item is the contract spending authority. Um, and I don't I don't want to go too far with contract spending authority yet. I'll come back to it uh, once we get through all the fields. But that's that's uh, when you're approving a contract. That's what the Board of Education is approving. Then we put in the spend uh, for the most recently completed uh, fiscal year. That's fiscal year 22 and then the current year uh, spend to date and then the total spend. And if the contract goes back prior to 21, it's going to include that spending um, as well. And then the remaining uh, contract authority. So that would be just the contract spending authority less the total expended should equal the contract, contract spending authority remaining. And then the percentage is just um, the amount remaining 
divided by the uh, total total um, amount of spending authority. Before we get into uh, too far with this, uh, I think it, it it makes sense to talk about spending authority versus budget. Um, when we're bringing uh, contracts to the board for approval, um, that represents what we believe uh, we'll need over the period of time of the contract. So if we bring a contract uh, for $2.2 million, we believe over a five year period, um, we would be spending $2.2 million. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that we have additional funding for that, that contract. It could mean that we um, are going to free up uh, spending through uh, another contract that maybe we're de-emphasizing or maybe another contract is coming to an end and this contract is in, a, in effect replacing that contract. So spending authority does not necessarily mean that we have additional budget or really we have any budget at that point in time. The only way we can really actually spend money on a contract is by having the spending authority that's granted by the board and also having available budget to to um, to spend on that particular contract. So um, I, I want to make sure that I, I make that um, that uh, point that contract spending authority is is not directly related to budget. So this report I think will bring up some good conversation for budget, but it's not necessarily a budget. It, it's not a budget report. It's a it's really more of a, um, a buildings and contracts report, and it's talking about the contracts that we currently have out there and what the spending authority is. Does not necessarily mean uh, you. Uh, you could add up all the spending authority and say that's the budget that we have. That's they're they're separate items, um, but certainly we need to have budget. Um, we ha need to have budget available if we want to um, utilize these contracts. So, I kind of wanted to make that differentiation as much as I as much as I can at the start of the of the discussion, um, and then I think at that point. Um, I'll open it up for questions, and certainly uh, we have uh, staff that can speak about the specific contract, uh, what we're trying to accomplish with a contract functionally, what, what we're trying to uh, achieve, um, and any kind of uh, dollar questions would be something that I would uh, uh, try to answer for you. So at this point, I I open it up to to uh, to questions. Thank you, Mr. Hartlev, for this information, and thank you, um, everyone, Mary, and everyone for being here tonight. I do appreciate that very much. Um, I think Julie had a question. Just go ahead, Julie. Thank you, Ms. Dominowski, and thank you, Mr. Hartlove. Um, and you touched on my question, Mr. Hartlove, which is really the only one I have. And if we can't answer this, I I don't see the usefulness of continuing, which is what is our FY24 budgeted amount for each contract? because I'm only interested in what we plan to spend on each of these contracts, not our line of credit or our spending authority. It really right. is what are our planned expenditures moving forward, because even knowing last year's spend and the prior years is helpful, that doesn't tell me what we plan to spend. And that's the purpose yeah. of this meeting is to looking at our FY24, we're trying to um, evaluate that and decide what our priorities are moving forward. So do we have that information? That was a data point we had requested. It, it, and I think I'm really glad you asked the question because you're cutting right to the important point here is that information doesn't exist. It's, it's uh, and maybe I want to back off of that a little bit. We can, but we don't budget um, by contract. We budget for, um, an overall area. So uh, for curriculum, textbooks, we but we have an amount that we budget for those items. We can we back that up with what we think we're going to do at the time we put our budget together. But these 
these contracts will, uh, as you're pointing out, they'll add up to more than what our budget is, I believe, because these represent uh, contract authority that's in place, contract spending authority. But some of these uh, we may still have open because we may have a need in the future, but we may not plan on spending too much more for them. We may just need to say replace some textbooks with them. So we want to keep them open, but we may not be spending much more on them, even if there's plenty of spending authority left. Um, others we may be emphasizing more. Um, so so we I saw that when you requested it and I kind of we kind of talked with staff about how to, to, to see if we could achieve that. Um, and it really we don't have a a budget per contract that we that we anticipate spending um, each year. It, we don't have that. So, uh, you know, it's a good question. And I and I agree that you're you're that this doesn't have as much usefulness if we don't have it by budget by uh, by contract by budget or budget. I'm sorry, budget by contract. Sure. And and what's concerning with what you just said, and that's what I anticipated um, being the answer is that the board approves the spending authority based on projected expenditures. Those projections are based on something and they're, they're long term projections on a project plan. And we have requested project plans. I've requested them until I'm blue in the face. What is our plan? What is our five year plan with this? software we're rolling out? What is our plan regarding this um, tool we're rolling out? What what does that look like? And the board doesn't see it and we don't need to see it at that level of detail. But when I ask for a budget for FY24 for the rollout of X and I hear you say we don't have a budget for that, that tells me there's no plan. And I don't think there's not a plan because I, I know we have folks that are that have a plan so there's a disconnect here and, yeah. and what I, I guess what I'm asking for is to know that there is a plan. Are we moving forward with this? Are we not moving forward? And and really what we're just we're our focus is the budget and we want to know are we not going to spend on this moving forward? Are we spending millions on this moving forward? It could be anything and with these open contract spending authorities, we're granting that authority to fall anywhere in the range of that. And, and what I hear you saying is it could be anything. There's no oversight in anything. And so that doesn't work for me. Yep. And and I hear your question. And 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 I think it's we probably and this is this is I think good to kind of hash through this and get understandings of things. You know, the when we got the the request in, it it was specific to contracts. And so that's what, what we kind of because we didn't have a lot of time, we just put it together and figured we get it out there and then we'd have the discussion on on uh, Monday night. Um, you what you're asking for and it w and I don't want to over promise because it wouldn't be necessarily all work that we would do. But if you're asking for what is the underlying plan um, and underlying um, the, the underlying data that supports the a specific budget li line item that we should be able to produce in some in some manner. I mean, it, it could be a lot of work if, in the in the curriculum area. There could be quite a f uh, bit of work putting that together. But when we when we build a budget, we build it based upon a, a plan for what we're going to do. So we should be able to produce that. And again, I don't want to promise someone else's um, um, ability to deliver that, but I believe we probably could deliver that. Um, but the the asking for it from asking about specific contracts is really what we're trying to accomplish through buildings and contracts is um, a specific individual contract. So it's it's kind of the weeds as opposed to the big plan. Um, but the plan exists. Um, and and I think understanding where you're coming from, and and I'm sorry, I you know, not to get this to have to go through this this discussion, but we understanding that we could certainly 
try to put something like that together. I'm not promising that we would be able to get everything you need, but we should be able to kind of give you the underpinnings of the plan, how we came up with uh, a particular budget line item. Sure, and, and I'm not trying to get into the weeds, but looking at it from an oversight lens, there are very few points in which the board approves any of this. And we approve it at the contract level when it comes to us, and we approve the budget. And there's a lot that happens in between. You all yeah. make the work happen, right? We right. only see it at a couple of key, you know, key stages, but our approvals are very limited. And what I'm acknowledging are the disconnects and the questions that this raises for me, which is, OK, we've approved $5 million spending authority for X. OK, what what is going to happen to that? We know that there's a budget of of Y. Do you plan to spend it on X or do you plan to spend it on Z? And we're going to be asked to approve it for Z there. That's a disconnect for us right now. Right. So I think what this committee's trying to figure out is we've granted you a spending authority and I'm you collective you the system. Right. I'm not picking on anyone and saying and and not cr just curriculum either, even though I know that's what our focus is. Um, and we're, we're trying to piece this together, understanding that we only have a couple pieces of a thousand piece puzzle here. So I don't want to make any more work on anybody than is necessary, but at the same time, we need the roadmap to understand right, right. our do, to do our job as oversight and to be able to understand Ms. this. Ms. And Ms. There, if I, if I may, Ms. Ms. is trying to speak yeah. as well. Ms. Hen, if uh, I think, um, and I hear uh, Dr. Boswell McComb is uh, speaking up, and that's who I was going to pass it off to. I don't want to over, over promise for, for uh, what they can produce, but it is really, um, I, I would like to hand it off to Dr. Boswell McComas and have her uh, uh, weigh in on, on, on how much that she could actually produce as far as uh, supporting the budget. So good evening, everybody. Um, for those who may be listening and don't know me, I'm Mary McComas, and I have the pleasure of serving as Chief Academic Officer. So I uh, thank you, Ms. Hen, for the opportunity to clarify because we do have plans. I I want to make clear that um, we don't bring spending, we don't bring forward a request for a contract and spending authority with no plan. Like I don't willy nilly come and say, please give me $5 million and I have no plan on how to use that over the life of a contract. I would never do that. I would never uh, tolerate one of our uh, team members doing that. Uh, so first and foremost, I want to dispel that um, because we do in fact have plans. And um, as you know, for um, anything that my team brings forward uh, that's curricular related, we always present in a curriculum committee before it comes to contracts. And in the curriculum committee, we work to provide um, an entire presentation where we're sharing with everyone what the product, service, or resource is, um, what is the data that is indicating to us that we need that. It may be, for example, a reading intervention uh, program, and then we'll uh, share where exactly that fits in the development of reading. Uh, we'll talk about um, what um, is involved with the resource and how we'll be implementing it. We often try to help everyone understand what's that mean like cost per pupil because I know sometimes when you're looking at contracts and it might say millions of dollars when you uh, break that down over 111,000 students or whatever the grade level or grade band is uh, that might come out to be a hundred dollars for a new science textbook or two hundred dollars for a new science textbook um, and we work to kind of break that down to make sure that um, all of our board members and our public are aware of what these resources are, how we use them, why we need them um, before they even get to the contracts committee. So I just want to share with everyone that uh, we do not bring forward something without a thoughtful plan. Uh, plans do change. Um, I'll use COVID as an example. Uh, whatever plans that we had, of course, the world turned inside out and upside down in a, in a moment's notice and, and plans had to be adjusted. Uh, but I do truly want to assure everyone we bring forward uh, a plan of how that um, is expected to be spent over the life of a contract. Um, one example that comes to mind, for example, is open court. Uh, we have consumables with some of our um, programs that we know every year we're going to need to buy another 
round of those resources uh, for whatever grade level of students because it's an interactive resource the students will use um, and then you know we need to replenish it the following year so I just use those as some examples that I hope I have helped um, clarify and, and assured people that uh, it's not brought for with uh, out thoughtfulness and Dr. Thank Boswell McComas Oh, sorry, Mr. Hart. Yeah, and I actually huh? prefer McComas. Dr. McComas is what I prefer, so thank you. I, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, That's I, no I worries. No um, worries. One of the things I, I, I was thinking about as you were speaking is, is that uh, the curriculum and instruction went through a zero-based budgeting process this, this, oh. this um, go round. So what you're saying is, you know, exactly what they were doing when they were putting their budget together they were going and saying what makes up this line item and what do we you know do we need all of these things or do we not need them and if we don't do we have needs in another area that we could uh, maybe take some of these dollars here and support something instead of asking for additional uh, uh, budgetary authority um, could we repurpose some funds to do something else instead of um, instead of just asking for additional dollars. So I wanted to make sure you didn't uh, forget that because that was a really important uh, thing in in our budget development that happened this this year for for curriculum and instruction. Thank you for uh, bringing that up. I again I appreciate you doing that um, because I did not uh, share. Um, Ms. Hen, and for those of you who know me and have worked with me over the last uh, eight years, um, I do take our financial management very seriously. I work hard to ensure that we're optimizing those resources for our students year upon year. Um, and um, to that effect, as, as Mr. Hartlett Love shared, this year I zero based the CNI budget to rebuild it from the ground up uh, to make sure that we had um, funds in areas that we needed it. I'll share the fine arts uh, office was one of the areas that each year because they do so many things um, for our students that often uh, I found year upon year that I needed to be able to move some money to support their um, their work and so part of their zero basing was to make sure that taxpayer dollars were in the right places to support all the things that we do for kids. So thank you for that opportunity. Uh, Mr. Hartlove, I forgot to um, mention that because I saw that as our internal hard work that we needed to do to make sure things were appropriate. Thank you. Thank you. That yeah. sounds great. Yeah. Just as a follow quick follow up, um, Dr. McComas, and and yeah. I just want to be clear, I, I never doubted that you didn't have a plan. It, Thank I'm you. Trying to <laughs> I connect, appreciate that. I'm trying to connect um, the, the data we see and this, this spreadsheet's fantastic um, with what with the plan that you have, because I think we've got two pieces that um, would be really helpful if they could be brought together. And what I'm looking for are the fi financials. And if you've gone through the exercise, and that's a lot of work, I, I know how much work goes into that. Um, so thank you and thank you to everyone on on this call who's who was involved with that. Um, there have to be dollar amounts somewhere. And, and that's what I'm asking um, this committee to see and the board to see that that budgeted amount for maybe it's not at a contract level maybe it's at a different level but if those could be brought together because like you said you have a plan um if if it's at a product a service um, a resource level that would be fantastic because i do think we need to know um what products and and to understand the need like you said you've you've gone through this exercise um not not in terms of a justification you've already justified it we have faith in your your exercise and in your plan but it helps to put those dollars next to the resources and for our public to see yes this is where your taxpayer dollars are going this is why they're needed these are this is how it's benefiting students that's powerful for them mm -hmm. to see yes brain pops amazing this is what it costs um I'm hearing from parents currently now as we're going through the budget cycle, please don't take away X. You know, my son and daughter loves it. For them to be able to see it on a spreadsheet like this, and this is a public document, which is great, um, is powerful. And it just justifies our investments in this for them to have a tangible way to see where their dollars are being invested. That's all. If Absolutely. we could bring those two together. That I think we, we can work and think about what's the way to make that um, clear and meaningful for everyone because I really 
uh, do want to support, you know, each of you in your role, but our our community and understanding where the the dollars do flow and how they do support uh, students. And of course, not every single resource is used for every single student. You know, there are some uh, sure. resources that are specific. Uh, in whatever way that is. Um, I'm always happy to help everyone have a greater understanding of these things because it is it is complex um, and it's important that people have confidence in how we're using the resource. So I'm, I'm happy to come together and figure out whatever it is we need to figure out to help everyone have a good understanding. Thank you. So am I understanding I'm correctly that, that going through that zero-based um, process, that's something that exists that you and Mr. Hartlove could put together for us without too much difficulty? Right. Well, the zero base process is where um, I, we took the, um, the, the funding for the division. Um, and what I did is I looked at the needs of each of the offices and what is it that they annually spend to support programs. So for example, um, and forgive me my team, I'm just pulling different examples to illustrate points. Um, in the science uh, team, we have the Star Lab program, right? So how much does it cost for us to run the Star Lab program every single year uh, to make sure that that direct programming for students is sustainable? I often sound like MPT because it's about sustainability um, uh, for resources for our students and teachers. Um, and so I had every office go through and identify what actually is the annual cost of running their programs, whether that's a program like Star Lab or that's annual consumables in open court um, or whatever the case may be. And what are the needs of that particular office to make sure that those um, resources are in place for students reliably? Because I understand that we are in um, tight budget times and, and will continue to be, um, and that you know now is not a time where we're looking to go um, expand our expansion, um, as you saw the other week, was really mo largely anchored in the guidance of the blueprint, uh, which is legislation and not just because, you know, Mary wants to do something new and, and exciting. Um, and so that's what that zero based budgeting process uh, was about. I don't know, Mr. Hartlove, if you want to explain anything better, you're a budget person, so maybe you have different language, but it's pretty much no. I just looked at everything and so where do where is it that we how, where is it we really need this, right. these funds to make sure things are secure and stable for our students and our teachers and principals? No, you've done a nice job of, of explaining it. And and I don't want to, um, I, I think if I hear um, uh, Ms. Hen, if I if we were able to take because most of what you 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 the board, the committee had asked for um, curriculum and instructional uh, supplies and materials. So if we were to total up that budget and kind of say for FY24 our our kind of what the plan is for 24 for those dollars, that's that's kind of what you're asking for. Correct. And I would hope that each office also looked at its budget to say when Dr. McComas asked what is needed for the Star Lab program, that they looked with a critical eye at need. Yes, um, yes, ma'am, they did. And um, I pressed them, the, my fiscal officer, and I really pressed that they need to justify uh, those funds. It was not a given. So again, that's this idea of like, if, if you know, I looked at them and said, you have zero money. Now tell me what exactly do we need to have in place to support our programs? Um, and then, you know, I made adjustments as necessary. So um, if there was an office that perhaps um, they justified everything that they uh, requested and need and that there was some money left over in that department, but I needed that resource and another office. Again, I always like to use the fine arts because uh, I always felt like every year I was trying to find additional funds to support all of our fine arts um, programming. Then then I would work to have that then become permanently part of the fine arts uh, office budget. I, I just want to follow up um, on that a little bit. Thank you, um, sure. Dr. McComas, for expanding on it. So the way I'm looking at this and just, you know, shut me up if I'm wrong. Um, yeah. So you ask when you come to the board and ask for a contract authority spending and you have yeah. a bidder and you select the bidder, there is some amount that there's a certain amount that needs to be paid each year for that contract. Yes. Yes. Correct. And is that predetermined or is that determined? When is that determined? 
Yeah, so we do. Um, it's a great question and thanks for giving me the opportunity to kind of help unpack how that works. And so um, I'll use, let's say, open court and, okay. and Ms. Shea can correct me as need be, um, but I just use that because that's a product that everyone's very uh, familiar with and people um, like the phonics program that we have. So we will enter a contract with a vendor and say, you know what, we want to use this product for our phonics program. We're going to create a contract over five years so that we can lock in the price of the resource now. And so five years, that's, you know, the price is locked in. We anticipate buying a thousand copies of that resource every year. Um, and so that's how we build that projected budget for the contract. We say, you know, however much it's going to cost to buy a thousand every year for five years in a row, that's going to be the um, uh, authority, right? Or the permission. I always think like it's like our permission. We're re requesting permission to spend $5,000 over five years. We anticipate spending a thousand each year for this resource. Um, now there are some things that can adjust that, right? Because it is a, it's a, you know, a, an evolving context because maybe next year we get an extra 500 kids. So now instead of me buying a thousand, I need to buy 1500. Or likewise, maybe the year after that, uh, God forbid, a, a something crisis hits and our enrollment goes down. So instead of spending the thousand, I thought, Maybe I'm only going to buy 700. So you can see it fluctuates. The other thing that's important to keep in mind is when we um, develop that as an office, so that, that would be, in this case, the phonics would be an ELA um, contract, right? We are anticipating what we will purchase centrally, right, for the whole school system. But in addition, we build in a little bit of extra buffer because as a principal, a principal may, um, you know, maybe a classroom gets flooded and their materials get swiped out and they need to buy replenishment. Maybe they need to buy an additional 30 for whatever reason. Uh, the principal can go in and buy an additional 30 books against that contract. So we always try to anticipate a little bit of buffer in case a school needs to do a one-off purchase of this product. Um, and of course, if they were to do that, it comes back to that same spending authority. So, you know, our uh, total, our permission, you know, we start uh, subtracting down until we have no more. We have spent it all um, in terms of we've used up all the permission. And of course, that falls out over different budget cycles. I hope I explain that in a way that makes sense. Ms. Shea or Mr. Hartlov, I don't know if you've had anything else to add. Yeah, I just I thought that was really good. And and I think um, the other part of that, though, so that's the spending authority uh, side. Then there's the mm -hmm. budget. So if 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 uh, Dr. McComas is thinking that next year she wants to implement this, first thing she needs to do is get the spending authority. She needs to let the board know, hey, I, I this is something that I want to procure. The next thing she has to do is, is make sure she has budget in 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 line to do that. And that budget is either going to come from a request for additional dollars or freeing up of other dollars. She may know that something else is coming to an end, that you know something is going to be phased out. So as one thing is being phased out, she's ramping up something, something else. Now, if if the board doesn't approve the spending authority, then she has to go to plan B. She has to, you know, so there's so she's kind of planning for multiple, you know, potential things to, to happen, but it's important to understand the spending authority does not, if you, if, as a board, you approve that spending authority, that doesn't mean we have additional dollars for that. That means we may ask, ask for those dollars, but we may also try to find them within our existing budget. So hopefully that helped a little bit. Yes, All right. Thank, thank you. you. Um, if I may let Ms. Shea just expand a little bit, and then I want to make sure I clarify if it's not what Ms. Shea is adding. And I see, Mr. Kuhn, you have a question as well, so. So um, thank you, and thank you so much for um, the, the question. I just wanted to add because, especially because, as you mentioned, Dr. McComas, sometimes the general public and our stakeholders are, are watching. Um, one important distinction is that we're not obligated to that amount, so we hold all the cards. So Open Court's a great example because we have great data and our Dibbles data is showing the hard work of our teachers and students. But if that were not the case, say two or three years into it, and we made a decision not to continue, we're not obligated 
to that amount of money. So we don't owe that vendor that amount of money, which I think is different. If I hire a painter to come to my house and I sign a contract saying I'm going to give the painter $5,000, then I'm obligated. That's not the case here with spending authority. And I think that's an important distinction because we're always using data to, to analyze. Um, and so you'll see some contracts and you can kind of see the spending stopped. And so that might reflect an example of that, either a contract we're no longer using or because it's a product that um, we're not continuing to support. And then the only other piece I was gonna add um, about that zero-based budgeting when Ms. Hen was asking about two, um, we're incredibly fortunate in our division to have Denise Frock who works with us because that conversation that Ms. Hen talked about in terms of a critical eye to need, we're also doing that all year long. So even though the budget comes annually, we work as a team, as a division, because sometimes needs can arise in one content area, um, either because there's a need our students are demonstrating or our schools are requesting. Um, so we also work with each other to make sure that this year's budget is spent for this year's students to make sure that we maximize those opportunities. So while we've had a big overhaul this year, that's a process that we engage in under Dr. McComas's leadership quite regularly to make sure that we are uh, being responsive and flexible to make sure that those dollars go to the needs of kids. Thank you. Uh, it's not, I, I understand the spending authority is not, you know, it's, it's just what we're allowing you to spend over a period of time. My, my question really relates to the fact of um, when we purchase curriculums like MyDo, like Open Court, and um, say that doesn't work. And what happens when we decide to implement the next one and then you're asking for a spending authority of 15 million to 20 million to implement a new curriculum that may has been tested in other schools but has not been tested in our school and our teachers haven't had the chance to use it and now we're investing more money in a new curriculum. Yeah. And I just um I'm trying to find a way where like there's more accountability or more transparency in, okay, we spent this on this contract. Now we're getting out of it because we we saw that it didn't work where the, it was, you know, the Fontes or Pinnell or um, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, what yes. happens to that money? One that I, I don't see where like where that yeah. contract ended and we put the money back into something else because of for budgetary reasons and when you're asking for a large spending authority and we don't even know that we haven't even piloted yet or we're just starting to pilot it. Yeah, so that's a great question. I'm actually really glad that you've given us the opportunity to unpack that because I do think that there's a great deal of misunderstanding, um, you know, uh, in the community at large about around that. So and again, I'll invite Ms. Shea to help me and Mr. Hartlove. So um, I'll take uh, let's take the Fontes and Pinnell, right? So, you know, we no longer use Fontes and Pinnell. We have not spent against that contract in, I think, Ms. Shea, three years at least. Well, we have not purchased Fontes and Pinnell materials, but that contract identifies other um, classroom library vendors. So I just, again, I want to separate, as uh, Mr. Hartliff said, contract versus vendor. But yes, we have not purchased the Fontes and Pinnell materials in several years. Right. So, so wait, that's a good, follow up on that. How do yeah. you how is Fontes and Pinnell in the same contract as another vendor? Like, why wouldn't that be on two separate lines? Because when oh, Dr. McComas, do you want to answer or do you want me to? Oh, well, uh, yeah. So that's and that's this is an example of why it's so good. We're unpacking this. So a vendor may sell many products, right? I may um, I'm, uh, I'm trying to think of like what uh, maybe this is just a quirky example way back remember there used to be something called pampered chef right i remember going to pampered chef uh being invited to pampered chef things and pampered chef would sell like 15 products i might only buy like one um or maybe i might buy three things but i'm not going to buy their entire line so that's why the vendor is would be that um in the silly example i'm using pampered chef but i may have the ability to purchase multiple products from them or maybe it might just be a singular one so again Miche or um mr yeah. hartlove if you want to uh, correct anything that i've no, just explained that's all good information and 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 i think you know we go back to the you know the buildings and contracts in our contract process is really there to make sure that we are using when we're buying something, we're getting the best, the best value. So if we want to go out and 
so it's it's not necessarily a budgetary uh, exercise. It's an exercise in curriculum needs something. We want to go out and procure it, and we want to procure it in the most efficient way possible. So there's a process, and we try to get it through a vendor who can provide it, um, you know, as as efficiently as possible. So it's really how we procure things, and you know, without the procurement process. You know, we may be buying vehicles from my my uncle Vinny. You know, which we we don't want to do. We want if we want if we need a truck for uh, Baltimore County Public Schools, we want to buy that truck at that provides the best performance at the lowest price. And we do the same thing with curriculum. And that's why we have a process. And you see multiple bidders, and you see what they offer. And and we're trying to get we're trying to get the best uh, price. But it's not necessarily. It, it informs the budget process, but it's not the budget process. It's the procurement process. It's how we buy things, not how we budget things. Can I add to the reading portion of the question, if that's okay? Because I want to get um, to Ms. Dominowski's question, and there's been several questions specifically about Fontes and Pinnell. Um, and I want to offer, while not going off course with a budget meeting, that you know this is a national conversation. The distinction I want to make, which answers your question about why Fondas and Pinnell can be on a contract with other vendors, is that in Baltimore County, Fondas and Pinnell was never our core English language arts curriculum. So a lot of what you see in the national conversation around reading are for school districts for whom that was their core. That was their core curriculum was published by Fondas and Pinnell. If that were the case here, we probably would have had a contract solely around that curriculum in the same way we do for open court, illustrative math or bridges. In Baltimore County, we purchased different products, some of which were published by Fontes and Pinnell in the past, which we don't anymore, um, including things like the benchmark assessment system and level libraries. So the contract that we currently have, Fontes and Pinnell was included along with other vendors such as Lee and Lowe Bookstore and, and several others around flooding our classrooms with libraries some of which are curated by topic or content or um, different cultures, and some of which were curated by level, going with the information that we had at, at the time. So in that particular example, since what we were purchasing were bins and baskets of books, Fontes and Pinnell was one vendor that responded to that request for information, as did several other vendors that each had a different um, approach to funding classroom libraries. So we do not have a contract that is about purchasing the Fontes and Pinnell curriculum as a core ELA curriculum because that was never how it was used in BCPS. So if it were, then that would have been a separate contract. Your other question about you know, how are we holding ourselves accountable when something doesn't work? I think that's a part of the larger process that we talk about in curriculum committee, that we talk about in contracts committee, but that we also talk about through frequent updates to the board around achievement. Because of course, materials that you purchase is just one aspect of the overall impact on student data and student achievement, right? And so we, we have to look at all of those things together, whether it's instruction in the classroom, the, the taught curriculum, the written curriculum, the assessment, and also professional learning. Um, so I think part of our efforts are to continuously look at that data to see, is it working here? We do try as you referenced, to have pilots to try to get as much information we can about how things work um, with curriculum. But the other thing that is new to the ed educational world in general, um, we also have the benefit now of third party evaluators like Ed Reports, like the What Works Clearinghouse, um, like Evidence for ESSA, where we can take national data around how this product that we're trying to use in BCPS um, has worked in districts like ours that have commensurate student populations. Some of our work with our teachers union around things like pilots really initiated at a time when we used to write our own curriculum. And so we couldn't rely on those third party vendors to help. So I don't want to get too far away from budget, um, but I did think it was an opportunity to explain the difference why sometimes we have a contract that is solely with that vendor for that specific curriculum like open court or bridges or illustrative math. In this case, the contract around uh, leveled and independent reading collections, that's a contract about flooding classrooms with books. And Fonda Sabinell was just one of the responding vendors. Just to follow up since you brought it up about using third party evaluators. Um, 
why not um, involve more of our teachers that are using the curriculums and find out what successes they're having? Because you can you can tell some teachers are having great success with curriculum, the curriculum that you're suggesting. Some teachers are not sure. And what they're doing to implement it. Um, I, I'm just wondering why there's not a committee of teachers that are actually using this in the classroom with students and asking them what's working and what's not. We, we actually do. So, Ms. Shane, sure. do you want to share all the ways that we engage teachers um, in not just the pilot, but in, in feedback on any of our curriculums? Sure, and I will also welcome Ms. Craft if she wants to join because she works specifically. So we have several ways. We do have focus groups meeting regularly with where we invite teachers that are piloting the curriculum. We send out survey data and I know just to, to clarify any misconception that teachers aren't honest, they are very honest with their feedback data, which we're grateful for. And to your point, Ms. Dominowski, we see everything. We will see teachers who love it, teachers who hate it, teachers who think it's wonderful and everything in between. Um, so we do have regular focus groups with principals and with teachers. We also have um, surveys and then we also have um, the, the, we have a few resource teachers that had not been supporting schools that each were assigned groups of schools led by one of the members of our leadership team. So I believe Ms. Kraft was supporting the West Zone pilot schools and we had um, Ms. Brooke, our ELA supervisor, supporting East Zone schools and um, Dr. Wolf, our coordinator, supporting Central. And so they actually went and visited the schools that were piloting to meet with teams of teachers, to meet with the reading specialists, to get their feedback, as well as to sometimes provide um, coaching sessions, do collaborative planning with them, um, and or talk about, you know, challenges that they were having. So Ms. Craft, anything you want to add to the different ways that we are engaging those pilot teachers in that process of giving feedback? Yeah, that was such a great answer, Ms. Shea. So all of those things, and we also uh, get feedback through surveys, uh, and we also do focus groups. And so we're constantly um, trying to find out what is happening, what's working well, and what's not working well. And so some of that has informed some of the resources and supports that we've put into place. Um, and so we are trying to learn from those best practices from teachers that are having um, a lot of success um, and then share those out. And we also have created a literacy leader PLC to specifically bring together the reading specialists that are at those pilot sites so that they also can form a community together. And so we really do try to get that feedback because at the end of the day we want students to be successful and so we know that our work is supporting teachers so that all students can get what they need. I think it's important and this is and Ms. Dominowski I know we haven't yet had a curriculum committee I'm excited that you're on that committee because you will find these are the things like we will bring that feedback we will explain that whole process in the curriculum committee. Um, I think it, one of our ongoing challenges is you know we have 9,000 teachers so if we get feedback from 100 teachers, it's just slightly less than or slightly more than 1%, right? And so that's always our challenge is the scope of magnitude of our organization. So um, it is not that we turn a deaf ear to teachers. It's not that we're not constantly trying to uh, get feedback. Every teacher can send us feedback and email. Um, and there's points of contact for like non new curriculum. There's points at every single unit uh, where teachers we ask it's it's built in uh, for them to provide us feedback on that particular unit feedback around what works feedback around what needs to be revised um, that feedback on those revisions are part of what then drive our summer work. Um, um, so I just ask that everyone keep in mind the scope of magnitude again 9000 teachers you know, 90 teachers is just 1% of uh, our teacher workforce. So. Ms. Ms. Dominowski, I think. I, Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chat, King had a question. That's what I was going to yeah. say. I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so, I could talk all night about curriculum. So. Dr. McComas, welcome. Thank um, you. I love books, Mr. Toon. I know, I and that's too. why I'm going to bring us back to talk about the money and the Great. books. Right. <laughs> uh, you know, there's a number of line items that talk about books. Yeah. And um, I had more of like a mechanical type of a question, right? So, for instance, sure. there's $13 million on this one specific JMI 612 18 uh, mm -hmm. line, right? And I think there's like 25% left. Um, 
And one of my questions is, because I've heard from teachers personally, um, especially talking about math, that replacing textbooks can be challenging and that they're very protective over their books, right? They don't want to lose books. Nobody wants to lose yeah. books. <laughs> um, but then that leads sometimes to um, a lack of resources. And that's why I've supported any time you've asked to buy books. I've been a proponent of that. Um, and one of my questions is, if I'm, let's just say I'm a geometry teacher at a middle school somewhere and I and I'm I'm missing I have like 10 more students than I have books. Right, so do do I need to? Just call up the warehouse and say send me 10 10 geometry books or do I have to go to my principal and say do we have funding for this? Can we purchase some books or how how does that request get fulfilled? Um, going forward, or do you buy like a thousand geometry books a year and leave them somewhere to be, you know, worked down over time? How does that work? Yeah, go ahead, Miss Shea. So it's, um, well, I'll just hand it over to my partner here. Go ahead, Miss Shea. Yep. So that's a great question. And Mr. Kuhn, we do support all of your efforts to support books. And you're right, you have to pry books out of teachers' hands. So um, what we do every year is we use enrollment data to drive the purchase. So we make our first um, when we do our multi-year um, purchase. So we'll use geometry, especially since we just replaced that. So at the initial purchase, we use current enrollment and then we usually do about a 10% buffer. And that's to make sure that we have additional materials on hand so that because schools are enrolling students all the time. So that's the first pass. Then what we do is work with schools um, and we download any changes in enrollment bi-weekly. So every Friday, we download any shifts in enrollment based on focus. Um, we coordinate with schools and then we contact the warehouse. Uh, so we do have a small overage that our incredible staff and logistics at the warehouse, you may remember when they were talking about bursting space, this is part of why. Um, we can reach out to them and say, um, you know, Delaney High School needs 10 more geometry books because they just enrolled students. Then we work with the warehouse staff and logistics. They will let us know your backup is getting low and you may need to replenish that. So it's all driven by enrollment. Um, schools would not have to fund anything based on enrollment or that consumable replenishment. That's automatic on us centrally. Um, so the central text back textbook fund funds the initial purchase and then the consumable replenishment year by year or any change in enrollment growth. The only time schools would use their own funds might be if a student lost a book and they were going to uh, potentially replace it and have the student pay that or if there was damage or, or some type of um, I can't imagine a student would do that through a geometry book, but you never know. But more than likely it's handled through us. Um, we did have a question earlier in this year because sometimes getting that information, that's why I'm grateful every time we ask this question, because the more times we can share that, the better. Um, Sometimes getting that information directly to schools can be our challenge. So we work with department chairs um, or at the elementary level through administrators and reading specialists just to constantly keep in communication. If you have a new student enroll or you just uh, are, are missing books, we absolutely have a mechanism by which we use that enrollment data in our focus system to drive that either sending it directly to the schools from the warehouse or when we need to submitting a supplemental purchase order um, to get those materials. Well, that sounds Oh, fantastic. But part of my concern is I've seen our enrollment projections and I've seen our actual enrollment and there's a tremendous divergence there in in many schools. So mm -hmm. that puts strain on the process you just described. So how do we because I don't know, you know, I would think there's lead time on, you know, a thousand new books or, you know, even a hundred yeah, books, yeah. Uh, yeah. depending on what you're asking for. So I'm wondering how how do you you know um, provide flexibility you know yeah. I mean Hampton Elementary School you know we had speaker after speaker there talking about how they have 800 students and they weren't sure. supposed to have you know over 760 you know yeah. and for a few years so so we know that it's there we know there's there's you know uh, you know and and what that what that means is that you guys are scrambling or the teachers and the you know the folks there are scrambling to get what they need for all those students so 
I'm, I'm, ex you know, you've centralized all the purchasing to provide this and try and get ahead of it. Do you have 10% on hand mm -hmm. sitting there to kind of feed mm -hmm. out? Is that how it works? Yep. Dr. McComas, may I, or did you want to answer first? Uh, no, well, you you can certainly add. I, I would just say that part of our work um, each year is to um, identify where we're having surges in enrollment growth versus maybe a school that maybe their enrollment went down for whatever reason, right? And trying to move those resources from school to school as need be. But um, but I'll turn it back over to you, Miche, because I know you know your teams really are up to their eyeballs and how we yep. do the logistics around making sure that we get the materials where they need to be. And so thank you for that, Dr. McComas. So Mr. Kuhn, yes, it's a both and. We keep a small overage on site in the warehouse in BCPS. So that's why our partnership with the folks that with that staff and logistics, if, if you get a chance before you leave to, to visit them, they're amazing. Um, so we keep a small supply on hand so that a school every week, we check that and we can get that material at them. And they're very quick. Usually it's in a few days, if that. Um, and then we keep our eye on that overage so that if we had a surge in, you know, grade six and we our overage is running low, we try to get ahead of that so that we have that turnaround time. And the amount of time we use varies by vendor. So my teams really stay on top of that. They visit the warehouse a couple times a year to do that inventory and they're constantly communicating with the folks in logistics. And then the second thing that I will offer for some of our core resources currently, in particular, since we've been using geometry, that's a good example. This is where that blended approach becomes really important because teachers actually can instantly access the PDFs of all of the resources. So there's no delay in students having what they need. They can either access it right on their device or they can print the PDF. They can even edit it if they need to and print it for students. And that way, even if it takes us a few days, we're not disrupting access to instructional material. So that's one benefit in some of our um, more recent uh, procurement efforts to have that blended approach because we don't have to have a disruption to them accessing materials. So that's how we handle that. OK, and and I'm guessing your your procurement plan and what you're budgeting for books is based on your experience, the enrollment plus, is it is it five percent, ten percent overage? What where do you how do you yeah like come, so, come up with the amount? It's a great question. We typically have been ranging around ten percent. Um, but it also, I'll be frank, depends on what we're talking about. So obviously consumables we know are going to be the most dynamic. Let's because, talk about physics books. Right. So so <laughs> physics books are. Because there a seems bit to be plenty of money left on that contract. <laughs> and I'm concerned so, that we don't have enough physics, you know, yeah, high so, end AP physics going. What's going so, on? So so loud and clear, if there's any physics teachers that need books, uh, we are we are not aware of any shortcomings. So we believe they have what they need. Um, some of that non-spending might be we allow that buffer over multiple years in case there's loss or damage. If a high school has a flood over, and I don't want to jinx anybody. We can sometimes get a frantic call from a department chair that they lost an entire class set. So we allow for that buffer. Um, so something like a hardbound textbook that is used in sets by teachers, we don't have as big an overage because that's not as enrollment driven. If one teacher is using the same hardbound set for multiple classes, we do give schools an overage so that if individual students need to take that book home, they have that. Consumables, we try to allow for at least 10% because that's more enrollment driven and that changes much more frequently. Teacher kits, we use um, uh, staffing conversations with principals. We ask them to let us know well in advance, hey, as you get your staffing allocation for next year, if you're going to add a fourth grade class, let us know in the spring so we can order those kits ahead of time. So because teacher kits are less dynamic, once in a while we get to hire new teachers during the year based on enrollment, um, but that we do annually, whereas um, any student consumable we do actually weekly. We're, we're tracking that. So one last question, and I'm going to I'm going to stop asking about books. Never you made a comment. I'm curious. I think one student, one book, but you just talked about sharing books across classes yeah. and I find that. Challenging if if students don't have access to their books, I mean, yeah, um, you know, to be able to have that book and take it home, especially, you know, children that actually need a book and not a, a device in their face. Yep. So <laughs> how do you yep. do you not plan for one book, one student? 
It depends on the nature of the curriculum. So in the math curriculum, it's one book, one student, because the nature of the curriculum is that the students are in that curriculum start to finish, and they're working through every resource in the book. If you think about, for example, our recent living systems curriculum, we work with the department chairs at schools because that um, book, we're not using page one through page 300 because we also have blended resources based on the Maryland um, core standards. So it's really driven by the content of the curriculum and how that resource is used. But even when we have some resources like the living systems, where we buy um, sets per teacher. We also buy an overage so that if any student within those classes needs an individual book to take home, they have it. So where we have hard and digital access, we typically, from a fiscally responsible perspective, do a blend. Um, where we have one for one use and consumables, we buy one book, book per student. So it, it really depends on the curriculum and how that resource is used but nobody should ever not have a book, right? So it's either through that blend or because we've purchased one book per student from a consumable. All right, thank you, I appreciate yep. it. Yep, I of know course. I've eaten up some of our time here. Um, I'm not quite sure how long we're gonna go. Uh, and if there are more questions right. regarding C&I, um, I Ms. Dominowski, I'd like to, to ask the bigger question about the money that the state is granting us if, if we yes, have time I, to get into that. I just wanted to let um, Mr. McMillian, if you had any questions about curriculum. No, thank you. I'm enjoying the conversation. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we can move on. Unless anyone else has any other follow-up questions about curriculum contracts. Um, Ms. Dominowski? Yep. I, I just wanted to read the question I had um, yes. in the chat for the public so that they're aware of yep. it and Mr. Hartlove um graciously agreed to follow up um but i asked whether um, the committee could receive two pieces of information um, if they're available one is the product names um, for this contract list that would be um, helpful i know that these contracts as we discussed apply to several um, different products but it be would be really helpful if we could see um, the list of those and also if each contract is assigned to a particular department and object class that would um, be very helpful in cross-referencing the department budget um, to the list of contracts so that we could see what is budgeted um, in the FY24 budget um, for that department and line item to at least have some way to reference the current operating budget. So Mr. Hartlove agreed to follow up on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that, that was something I think I asked for as well, um, who the contract was awarded to. And I know it was short notice and trying to get all this together. And I appreciate all the work that Mr. Hartlove and um, Dr. McComas and her staff did and are here to answer all of our questions tonight. Um, I think we'll be having more conversations about this, but it's been really good tonight and I appreciate all of your, your input. So, Thank Ms. You. Dominowski, are we, turn, are we turning the curriculum folks free? Yes, please. Yes, go free. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. I appreciate <laughs> Thank it. Thank you, Ms. Dominowski. Thank you, everyone, for my team and, and Debbie and Dave um, uh, and Carla, who were able to join us tonight. Thank you for the opportunity to unpack. Um, we genuinely want to be of service to help you and the public understand what we do and how we do and, and why we do. So, um, Sincerely, thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Hartlove. I, I hope we've been helpful tonight in some way. Yeah. So I appreciate your time, Dr. McCormick. My pleasure. Definitely. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye. Um, okay. So uh, the other request that came in was uh, the letter uh, uh, from Dr. Williams to uh, the county executive. Um, um, uh, some background on on what on what that is, and what what basically happened is, and in, in, um, you know, it's it's good news budget budgetarily, is that um, we put our budget together based upon um, estimates and 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 certain assumptions because you know we only have we only have you know. Um, we don't have all the information when we're putting our budget together. So, um, and cer certainly we have a new 
formula that this is really the first year of implementation. So, you know, this was this was new territory for us. Um, but the budget staff did, I think, you know, a great job in, you know, in uh, anticipating what the revenue uh, w would be. But the one thing that we did not know, um, we didn't know the impact was the measurement of of uh, free and reduced um, students. Uh, the, the we're part of, I believe, and, and Mr. Tantliff could could maybe fill in some of the gaps in my explanation, but we're part of a, a pilot that um, moved to uh, measuring the enrollment through uh, of of farm students through direct certification versus uh, the old method of filling out forms. Um, the bottom line on that is, is our farms count was significantly higher than than um, we anticipated, um, and that's leading to um, additional revenue of approximately forty eight point eight million dollars. And um, so that is obviously uh, um, is good news because it, it, it certainly allows for um, it allows for um, um, us to um, take care of some of the items that we work. <laughs> excuse me. I'm sorry, Mr. Hartlove. What did I say? It's close I, to I, fifty million dollars more funding, so that's yes. that's the good news, right? That is that's exactly right. That's exactly right. so. So you know, so that the, the, that's the good news is that we have dollars that we did not anticipate. And uh, that's helping to uh, kind of ease the budget a bit um, because what we would have otherwise had to have gotten from the county or through um, efficiencies or reductions, at least to the tune of 48 million, we don't have to do that. Um, so so that's kind of where we are. Um, I, that's the quick, the quick overview. I don't know if you certainly probably have follow ups from that. Yes. Mr. Kuhn, go ahead. Thank you. So, uh, real quick, how do we how do we miss fifty million dollars worth of aid? How do we how do we miss that that much of a projection? Because that's that's a big yep. that's a big it, dollar amount, like you said. It, so it is. I'll take first pass, and then Mr. I see Mr. Tantliff is here. Um, the first pass is 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 that uh, is the free and reduced uh, uh, number. We were, I think, we were uh, our base in the past was uh, uh, forty two thousand students, approximately, and this year the count went up to fifty seven thousand students. That's that's a significant thirty plus percent increase, almost forty percent increase in in that number. Um, so that's the that's the main driver. Mr. Uh, Tantliff, now that I've locked you into specific answers, now the floor is yours. You can answer the question. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, I think uh, Mr. Hartliff pretty pretty much got it. The uh, Maryland is part of the new um, Medicaid pilot run by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which, as you know, that that's who uh, funds most of our uh, food service money, all the free and reduced meals, et cetera. So there's a handful of states that are in this uh, pilot. And if you'll recall, when we do the, the community eligibility program, the CEP in 87 of our schools, you cannot collect forms anymore. Now, this, this wasn't an issue last year because uh, if, you, if you remember, we had universal uh, food everywhere across the country. So the CEP program uh, rollout really didn't come into effect until this year. So in the CEP schools, we can't collect forms. We can only use direct certification methods such as SNAP. <clears throat> but uh, a Medicaid pilot was rolled out this year. And as Mr. Hartlove mentioned, our free and reduced count went up by an extraordinary amount, 29%, which is unprecedented. Um, and certainly in reality, 29% more people, uh, children in the county are not uh, 
under free and reduced than were in the past, but how we're measuring them, right, wrong, or indifferent, went up by 29%. Uh, this was a statewide phenomena, so we're not really an outlier in that respect. Um, and I can tell you MSDE and the AIB are quite surprised at how much uh, of an increase this is driven in the compensatory education portion of state aid, uh, which is the part that's tied to the number of free and reduced students. So um, as this, you know, the number, uh, it just shot up way more than we, you know, would have thought about or anticipated because quite frankly, it's unprecedented. So I think Mr. Hardlove got it and hopefully that's just a couple more details I filled in. Um, Mr. Tantliff, is there is there a new calculation? Because you know we went from from having people fill out forms to just entire schools were getting you know free food because of and I'm drawing a blank on the program. So I CDP. how I you know are these yeah I'm sorry what was it called I, the the con the CEP program for yes, the eligibility. Yes. So so how you know. Is it a per student amount that is additive and that equals the the, the extra money is or is it an increase at plus a per student amount? Sure. That's just a lot of money. So um, the main thing driving it is the extraordinary increase in number of students. Now, um, because Blueprint is is implemented now, that is increasing the amount we get per student in all of the different, um, you know, if you want to call them tranches or the grants associated with state aid. Uh, but but the amount of the increase would have been, you know, probably a few million, if, if, which is what we were projecting, um, if not for this change. So for compensatory ed, there's a form that gets filled out. Um, the Food Service Department collects the data, and this is a separate report and somewhat separate measurements from, from the report that gets turned in by Food Service to uh, bless our official farms number. But in this report, it's uh, pretty detailed. And if it's a non CEP school, it shows the number of children who are eligible for free and reduced based on the forms they turned in. In CEP schools, uh, forms are not allowed to be collected. So direct certification is the metric that is used to count the children in that school that are eligible for free and reduced. The onset of the pilot has, uh, you know, as I've mentioned, significantly increased that number. Now there's some overlap, obviously, with uh, measures that we are already taken. But the overall increase uh, is, is just really huge. And as I mentioned, we were just talking about it on the MSD call uh, last week, and they they were just commenting that they they were very surprised and it was well above what they had originally anticipated when they got into the pilot. I, you know, I'm not well versed on all the particulars on how we got into it or what they predicted initially. Uh, but as I said, our increase from a percentage standpoint on our compensatory education grant is uh, I forget the exact average for the state, but we're we're kind of from a percentage standpoint at around the average from a dollar standpoint. Obviously, it's much more because we're a bigger than average county um, and interestingly and surprising to me, but maybe it shouldn't have been the counties with the least poverty had the biggest increase. And if you think about it, it's cost if you're in Montgomery or Carroll or some of the smaller counties that have traditionally less free and reduced, the Medicare number, because it was gathering so many kids as a percentage on a much lower base, uh, some of them saw increases of 40, 50, 60 percent. It's um, really quite interesting. And, and I don't know how to all shake out in the end, how they end up evaluating this pilot in the future, if it goes forward, if they determine that that is good or not. But 
All we know is uh, that data does count for this year's funding and it gave us a tremendous boost in funding when uh, preliminary state aid came out recently. Thank you. Um, with with all that said, right, you, you're kind of saying, well, this is a pilot and I'm, I'm curious about the risk we take by assuming the pulling these funds into operating, right? And and depending on what we spend the money on, <laughs> the funds not being there in future years, right? Is that is that something you guys are contemplating? Because in essence, the letter that was shared just shows, well, now we have this massive increase in funding. So now we don't need the money we asked or this much money we asked for the, the county for. Um, but that that could really come back to haunt us if this pilot is changed somehow or modified because they they say well this is just overly generous somehow well yeah, yeah, you did, gonna, you, go ahead chris no we can i, I the only thing i was going to say is is that it's since this is I, Witt and I, Mr. Tantliff and I had had this discussion and the, and we would have that concern if we were the only ones in this situation. But since there are other, since it's every other, juris, every jurisdiction is having this same uh, uh, experience, it would be very difficult for um, the state to back off of this quickly. If they if they were going to back off of it, they'd have to somehow phase out of it because it would be when we when it's in our base funding, we we have to we have to spend it. We can't we can't put it aside. So we ha and not spend it. So we it's going to go into our base spending um, and it, as it's going to for the entire state. So this it would be very problematic if something like that were to happen. Um, and every jurisdiction in the in the state would be would be up in arms. So uh, if if that were to happen, which I don't anticipate it happening, if that were to happen, they'd have to phase us out um, over a number of years. And I think with the large amount of funding that's coming, that's projected to come in uh, through uh, the blueprint, they could they could uh, ease us back into a lower number over a number of years. So so hopefully that that. Uh, helps. Thank you. Last question that I have, I know it looks like Ms. Hen has a question, but is these are federal funds flowing through the state to us via a grant, correct? No, no, this is this is pure state aid. It's it was part of the Thornton formula, which carried over into blueprint at enhanced levels. Oh, I thought I thought you were talking about Medicaid and food and and you talked about the department of agriculture at the beginning of this so i'm now i'm confused as to where the money's coming from that's my goal to confuse you good job you've, no. you've thoroughly confused me and i will sign no. off now Thank sure you. so uh because the food food service deals with the free and reduced forms because obviously they're the ones who are uh dealing with feeding the children so they're on point to collect the data. The, the direct certification data, which is, you know, is what feeds the, not feeds, avoid the pun, which provides the free and reduced percentages for the CEP schools. Uh, they have a method of collecting, they, it, it's uh, sort of an automated method where the data is fed into them and then they have to do some cross checking so they fill out the form that goes to MSCE that generates the compensatory aid funding. So yes, most of the food service USDA money, it comes from the feds. There's also some state money, but it's mostly federal reimbursement for free and reduced meals. But food service also is on point to uh, gather the data for the compensatory education form which forms the backbone of one of our state aid uh, large components, just like there's a special ed component, an EL component, et cetera. Yeah, it's the farms enrollment that's used for uh, the enrollment uh, factor for com compensatory ed. So you were right that there's a there's a there's a obviously we get dollars from the federal government as well, but this is our state comp, comp 
comprehensive education dollars that come uh, based upon your farm's enrollment. So it's state dollars, but it's a good, good question. Yeah, All right, thank you. Sure. Ms. Han? Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Tantliff. Good evening. Um, I may have missed you saying this, but are all schools CEP and non-CEP direct certifying now? Um, well, or just CEP? if you're if you're non C if you're a CEP school, you cannot collect a form. We did collect forms from our non-CEP schools, um, but I believe the direct cert number can be compared against the form collection and we get credit for the higher of the two in the non cp schools because the data is out there but i think generally speaking this isn't always true but the forms generally provide a higher uh count just to just okay. to kind I, of i'm sorry i thought we we just said the opposite because we was the direct certification resulted in a higher number than anticipated versus the forms. No, I, 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 I didn't say versus the, the forms. I, I said versus our base. So, you know, we're going to, when we're building our preliminary models, we're going to look at our numbers from last year. How many free and reduced children do we have last year? And there's usually not a dramatic change from year to year. You know, the right. trend's been up lately and it's a gradual change. But the amount of the increase due to this pilot, you know, could not have been anticipated. So it most, you know, that drove the volume in those CEP schools because the direct cert number shot way up because of the Medicaid. And actually, uh, you might be right because I haven't really looked at this. I was just saying historically, direct cert tends to understate free and reduced. But possibly now with the, the Medicaid pilot, th those schools may be at or above where they would have would have been. So you're right. I may have misspoken there. Or or it could be our numbers are up because. If we're certifying the whole school. In terms of participants or we're counting. No, that wouldn't be it because no, you're actually counting, counting the, the kids. Whole yeah, you're always counting the number of kids in the school. We're counting the number of school. So. OK, I'm I'm straight. Thank you. That helps. Um, sure. I thought I had a part two question, but it's just escaped me. OK. Um, only thing, the only thing I can add is, is when Mr. Tant when we first discovered this and Mr. Tantliff was was kind of going through the explanation and he felt bad. And I said, um, you know, I understand, but if you can bring us additional forty eight million dollars, we certainly that's the better direction than the other direction than we over over estimated revenue. So so, you know, this is you know, we'd love to be to have known this anticipated it. There's no way we could have. But if you're going to have you know, if you're going to be off, it's good to be off in this direction because um, um, then the other direction can be devastating. Absolutely. Oh, I know, re recall my my follow up question had to do with um, implementing the other schools that are now eligible for CEP. And if we knew what the cost, that was one of the questions I had submitted. If we knew the cost of doing so, I believe um, we I, had a count. I I can't speak to that. I think um, I think um, that that is addressed in one of the questions, and I, I think it was addressed with a broad range. And there's not a specific cost known yet. OK, but there's no advantage to doing so in terms of state funding over not implementing it. I mean, we want to feed kids, obviously, but. In in terms of what we learned in. With this, there's no advantage over the f farms forms to. Um, I so I think the. The medic, um, I, I don't really know the answer, I guess, to that question. And we don't know if the Medicaid pilot is going to stick around. I don't, I, I, um, I'm not sure how many years the pilot is for or, or what the results will be. So I don't think we'd want to make any decisions based on that. I think we'd want to make a decision based on, 
um, you know, is it is it the right choice? Is there an incremental cost associated with it, et cetera? OK, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. McMillian, do you have any questions? No, thank you. I will. Uh, unless there's any further comment or questions from the committee members. Hearing none, thank you both uh, for the presentation. Um, but hold on one second, guys, I need you to go up. Sorry. <laughs> My children were trying to say goodnight to me. Okay, the last item on the agenda is announcements. The next budget meeting will be on Wednesday, February 22nd, my sister's 51st birthday at 5.30 p.m. If there is any further business, hearing none, the meeting is now adjourned. Thank you for joining us. Um, truly, thank you, Ms. McComas, and all the curriculum team for being here.